Our reading today is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. If you're in need of a Bible this morning, you can look to the aisles. Our ushers have those available for you. If you do not own a Bible at home, you may take that with you. It is our gift to you today. If you have one of the Bibles the ushers just handed out, we're on page 977. And again, we're in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Follow along as I read. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, jointed and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, from each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning uh, for the ability to gather here at Mission Valley Church. We just ask that you be with us and that you be with Alfie as he preaches this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Hopefully you have time to have opened your Bibles by now. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. If not, you'll have some time while I just kind of do some uh, opening introduction to what we're going to be looking at. I feel like we all want to know what more I can do to be more a part of the church. What more can I do to be a more dynamic church member or a better church member? There's got to be something more that I can do. At least that's something that I think about. I, I think about what can I be involved in? How can I help the community? What can I do to spread what we believe and so today I want to look at uh, as we look at Ephesians chapter 4 I want to look at some of the qualities of a dynamic church member first I believe a, a great church member shares in the vision of the church I believe that if God's people will make a great commitment now did you hear what I said a great commitment, not a half-hearted commitment or a mediocrity type commitment, but a great commitment, one that you are totally and fully put into your, yourself. Everything you believe is put into this commitment. If you remember last week, Pastor Mike talked about that once we've been saved, once we've believed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus— that at that point, it takes effort on our part. And that's what we're going to look at a little bit, is that a great church member needs to put some effort towards his commitment. Well, what are we putting effort towards? Well, I believe the first thing that we need to do is look at what Jesus said when he said there are two great commandments. In Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first, or this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said these were the two most important commandments that he wanted us to apply to our lives. I believe if we will apply these commandments to our commitment to God as a church member, we will make a more significant difference in this church and in the community as we spread the gospel. So once you've believed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we need to put in effort, as Mike said. The effort is our responsibility. We can try to make a somewhat type of commitment, but effort is what we need to do. The second thing we need to put effort into is the Great Commission. The Great Commission, Jesus said to them, all authority 
Who is he speaking to? His disciples. Who are you? Once you've believed in the life, death, and resurrection, you are one of his disciples now. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. We are to go and make disciples of all nations. That's evangelism. That's to the world to proclaim the gospel. Make disciples. Literally, it means to make learners. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. This is discipleship. This is making learners. This is equipping the saints to do the work. Baptizing them. Pastor Mike talked about this last week. This is Showing people, once you've believed in Jesus Christ, this is an outward profession of what's taken place in your heart. You are showing people that you have been buried with Christ and that you have risen with Him in resurrection to a new life and that you are going to walk with the brothers and sisters of Christ as you grow in, in to be more like Jesus. Here at Mission Valley Church, we are a church on mission to see the valley transformed by the gospel. Did you, did you get that? We are a church on mission to see the valley transformed by the gospel. That's our responsibility. Your responsibility. You want to be a dynamic church member. We need to see what the vision is of the church. So first, a great church member sees and shares the vision of the church. Secondly, a great church member protects the unity. How do we protect the unity? First, we become more like Jesus. We become more united in the faith. We protect the unity as we grow to be more like Jesus. The goal is Christ-likeness. Some of you may have heard me say this before. If you've had me for counseling, I've told you this. If you've heard me speak, you've probably heard me say this. The goal when you got saved, when you believed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the goal was never to get to heaven. Did you hear me? The goal was not to get to heaven. If the goal was to get to heaven, the moment that you said, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I need Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I ask that you'd come into my heart and life right now. Forgive me. I want to follow you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. He'd have slammed you dead. Because he knew that you were going to sin again. The goal is not to get to heaven. The goal is Christ's likeness. The goal is for us to become more like Jesus so when the world looks at us, they see Jesus so that we can win more and more people to Jesus. The kind of love that we have for one another will show that we have Jesus in our hearts. That kind of love is a choice. Being happy. And loving is a choice that you make. Christ-likeness is a choice. You choose to say, as I read God's Word, I am going to apply it. 
You're going to put effort to applying it to your life. It's harmony as we become like-minded and like-hearted. It's humility as we esteem others as more important than ourselves. Christ-likeness. A great church member shares in the vision. Secondly, a great church member protects the unity by becoming more like Jesus. Christ-likeness. And thirdly, a great church member shares in the mission. I'm hoping by now you've had time to find Ephesians 4. We're going to be focusing mainly on verses 11 through 16. To understand the mission of the church, I want you to understand spiritual giftedness. Now, some of us believe that this, this verse talks about spiritual giftedness. But we're going to look at that more in depth right now. You see, every member of the church has spiritual gifts. We are a minister of the body of Christ. I want you to see that you were not saved so that you could look good. You were not saved so that you could feel good. You were saved so that you could be a part of the body of Christ to go out to reach and teach people until they could reach and teach more people for Jesus Christ. You were saved and converted to build up the body of Christ. That's the mission of God. We're going to look at this morning how you and I can serve this mission. Now, I want you to know that this next part, you can look up on the internet. You can buy books about it. You can go to seminars about it. You can take a class in seminary about church growth. In fact, you could probably go to some of the mega churches and see how are they doing it, church growth. But I want you to know all that they are doing is what God's Word tells them to do here in Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to know they're not doing anything new. They're applying to the 21st century what God told them to do in Ephesians chapter 4. A church that attempts to grow in any other way is doomed to have fleshly growth if they grow in any other way other than God's way. So let's look at the Word of God and see how we can fulfill this mission here at this church. The people behind the mission. First, notice verse 11. It talks about gifted people, not spiritual gifts. So let me sh show you verse 11. Now, I'm reading from the New King, New King James Version. He says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and equip, uh, for the equipping of the saints. Okay, that's going into verse 12. He did this. Notice he did not say, I give some the gift of apostleship. He says, I give some the gift of prophecy. I, I give some the gift of prophecy. He, no, he said, uh, not for, he gave apostles and he gave prophets and he gave some to be evangelists and shepherds and teachers. Now, those men all have different gifts. Some will have the gift of teaching. Some will have the gift of ministry or, or, or uh, mercy. But they all have different gifts. But I want you to see also, let's look at the first two that he calls. 
uh, apostles and prophets. Those two offices, that of prophets and apostles, have ceased. They ceased with the culmination of the New Testament scriptures. Now the ministry of apostleship and the ministry of prophets continues. The ministry goes on for that of, of the apostles as we send out missionaries. And the prophets continues as we preach the word. But the calling to that office, the office of the, of the apostleship and the prophets has ceased with the culmination of of the New Testament scripture. The word apostles literally means sent ones. Now I want you to realize there were 12 apostles originally that Jesus called out. And then in Acts chapter 1, we see the calling out of Matthias to replace Judas after he died. So he became the 13th apostle. And then later, and later on, we see the, the calling out of Saul of Tarsus when Jesus comes to him on the Damascus Road in a big, bright, shining light and makes him the apostle to the Gentiles. So those were the apostles distinguished either by being a witness of Christ's ministry or being called by Christ personally. All 14 of these men had experienced that in some way. So why did the office cease? It was because the apostles were called to affirm and establish the church. The rule book right here, well, it had already been written. So, the, the, the need for them was gone. So the, the second uh, reason we didn't need them is because all the Scripture, just like the Old Testament prophets, well, they ceased with the Old Testament being written, and the New Testament prophets, well, it ceased with the culmination of the New Testament Scripture. So if you hear someone saying, well, I'd really like to hear something new, you know, something different from this. Well, I want you first to realize the danger behind that. If it's new, it's probably not true. There were these offices and those two offices of apostleship and prophets had ceased. The ministry continues. Now, there's two other offices that we see here. That's of evangelists and then the shepherds and teachers. The evangelists, which I believe Pastor Mike probably falls under evangelist and shepherd and teacher. Listen to the definition and tell me if you believe that I'm correct on that. The evangelist was to explain salvation to pre-Christian and unchurched people. They explained the gospel and called men to salvation. They basically did two things. Establish churches and establish Christians. They would plant churches and they would be filled up as they shared and explained the gospel. Then, then there's the office of the pastor-teacher. Now, the word pastor comes from the Greek word poimus, which also can be translated shepherd. The pastor's lead or main job is to lead. And the teacher's main job is to feed. So when you put those together, the pastor, who is a pastor teacher, is to lead and feed with the word of God. Now, how did they lead? They were to lead by love. They were to lead 
by love and they used their different gifts. Those that had the gift of encouragement or the gift of mercy, uh, they would combine that gift as they would lead by love and feed with the word of God. Now, why is the pastor, teacher, and evangelist called to lead and feed? Look at verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. He does not say to build you up, but he says for the building up of the body. The whole church, the body of Christ, those who say, well, wait a minute, isn't that the reason why we hired the preacher so that he could go out and he could do that work? He could go out and witness to those people. He could go out and visit the people in the the hospitals and all of that. (laughs) I think that's like saying you, you, you come in at the beginning of the year and you join up at Lifetime Fitness or, or uh, EOS and, and you say, you know, I want to get in shape. And you, you join the membership, but you don't go to the gym and you don't use the machines expecting to get in better health. Or like Mike said last week, it's joining the church and saying, you know, I, I want to be a part of this church. I want to make a difference. But I don't want to be a part of any of the community groups. I don't want to be a part of any of the helping set up groups or take down. I, I just want to come and kind of listen. Mike said, that's not church. That's Harkins Theater. So if we want to be a part of the church, we have to put in some effort. It's our job to build you up. It's the the minister's job to build you up so that you can go out and do the ministry. You are to get ready and sent, sent out. You are to share the gospel. You are to walk out in the world like Christ. You are to be Christ-like everywhere you go. So that you can reach and teach the lost. Verse 13 through 16. Listen to this. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, making the body grow up so that it builds itself up in love. So first, we see the people behind the mission. Secondly, we see the process. Now, if you're taking notes, I'm going to go through the process. There's four parts to this, but I'll go through it quickly. In the process, we see the equipping of the saints. The equipping. First, the equipping takes place by the Word of God. 2 Timothy verse 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We, we build up, we equip the church the people in the church, by reading the Word of God, that you, by putting in effort, should be making a commitment to go through the Word of God. If you don't have it on your 
your Bibles. If you don't, uh, if you're not reading a, maybe a hard copy of the Bible, you can set it up on your phones. Put it on there. Hey, I want to read the Bible every day. You could read through it in a year, two years, three years. Your phone will help set, set you up. It'll remind you at whatever time you commit to reading it. In the morning, the afternoon, the evening. But you should be getting into God's Word so that you can be transformed by the Word of God. First, we are equipped through the Word of God. Secondly, we are equipped through prayer. Colossians 4 gives us good insight to this. Listen to this. Continue steadfast in prayer. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. Listen to this part. Always struggling on your behalf in his, in his prayers. He is always thinking of one of his brothers and sisters in his prayer life. That you may stand mature and fully assured in the, in the will of God. Prayer life should be happening in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, Hopefully someone prayed before you came to church. Hopefully someone is praying during this church. We should pray without ceasing. We should be praying as we worship. Lord, help me to worship you fully. We should pray before we come to the Lord's table. That we hold no grudges before we take the Lord's Supper. We should be praying as we go out into the community. Lord, put someone in my life that I can share Jesus with. Lord, help me to be transformed by your word. Help me, Lord, to be transformed as I hear you speak to me in prayer. Third, we are transformed by trials and tests. You see, one of the ways we grow is through test in our lives. Count it all joy, my brothers, James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfast, and the steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. Lacking in nothing. That's equipped. At the beginning of every semester when I was in college, we would get a syllabus. It didn't change when I went to my master's. It didn't change as I'm working on my doctorate. We'd always in every class get a syllabus. And that syllabus would tell you what was expected, what tests there may be in the future, what books or book they expect you to read, what projects you would have. And every time we got one of those, you'd have people at the right towards while final exams are coming up going, oh my word, I haven't read the book yet. What do you think we're getting tested on? The trials and tests are to show that you've completed the work, that you know the knowledge, that you've you put in the effort. It's so that as we are getting Christ-like, as we are trying to be transformed, you are going to be put through some trials and tests to put you into the, the you know the fire. To get rid of the impurities. This last one is the hardest one for all of us. We grow through suffering. We grow strong as we hurt. We grow strong as we are in pain. Then we become equipped. 1 Peter 5.10 After and after you have suffered a little while, the God of grace, 
who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. After I finished my Master of Divinity, I was pastoring up in New River. And my wife said, Alfie, no more, no more school for a while. Well, I need a break. You know, because if you didn't know it, your wife's in as much of the school as you are while you're going to school. Because you're studying, you're taking away time from the family. You're, you're in a test and you're stressed, she's stressed. You know, so she said, no more school for a while. And she's, I said, well, how long? And she said, at least three years. I said, well, okay. <laughs> Thinking to myself, that's exactly how long I've got to wait anyways before I can apply for a doctorate. So it worked out good. And then when I was applying, I was in really good shape as far as physically. I had no health problems as far as uh, surgeries and things that were chronic going on. I applied for the doctorate. I got accepted over at Southern. And no sooner was I in class and having my first of three neck surgeries. And then going on as I'm working, trying to complete, you know, the, the schoolwork, trying to write the dissertation that's uh, required. I have one of four surgeries on my right ankle. And so I'm going through this suffering. And at the time, I'm thinking, maybe I should just drop out of this because I was in so much pain and I couldn't continue with the writing in a timely manner. And my wife said, no, you're not dropping out because God's called you this and we've put too much money into this by now. <laughs> so suffering is part of what we will go through as we are equipped. And you have to realize that. So first, there's the people behind the mission. Secondly, we see the process of how we are equipped. And thirdly, we see the product. The product is part of the, the unity of faith. Notice I said unity of faith. Any unity that is based not or not based on the truth of God is not unity, but it's confusion. Unity means we come together doctrinally, that we have similar beliefs. Does that mean that we're not going to have some differences on what portions of the Bible say? No, but as a whole, doctrinally, we believe. We believe the most important thing here at Mission Valley Church is to go out and to reach the, the valley and to have people transformed by the gospel. Next, the knowledge of Christ. And I'm not talking about a salvation knowledge. I'm talking about a deep knowledge. Listen to Paul and what he says about knowledge here in Philippians. He says, indeed, I count it everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all as rubbish. Do you, do you see what he said? Paul has lost everything, and he says, it doesn't matter. It's rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know, 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 know him and the power of the resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That knowledge he's talking about, that's an intimate knowledge. That's knowing Christ saying this is a love letter. 
And I long to hear from him in my prayers. I long to read his word. I want to know Christ. I want to become Christ-like. So I want to know who he is. That's the kind of knowledge I'm talking about. That we become Christ-like. Christ-likeness is not based on what you know as far as, hey, I know the Bible and I can quote a scripture. I'm talking about that intimate knowledge where His Word is making you walk and talk and act like Jesus. He transforms your heart. I don't care what college you've gone to or what master's degree you have or if you have a Ph.D. Christ-likeness comes through in your character. Christ-likeness is not based on your academic knowledge. It's that intimate knowledge allowing Christ To change your heart. So we need to become Christ-like. And then we have to have that doctrinal integrity where we agree similarly. He says, no longer tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. If someone is preaching something that does not line up with the Word of God, you should be in His Word so that you could go, wait a minute. That does not make sense. That's not what God's Word says. Not the person that goes, oh, this is new. This is going to make me spiritually hungry. He's not telling you to look for something new and and to want to be In the Spirit, what He wants you to do is be obedient. We are to be obedient to His Word that He's given us. Not tossed to and fro by the waves of every wind of doctrine. Why are we tossed so easily? Because we refuse to be obedient. And that we might have a loving testimony, he says in verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. When I was a young Christian, I remember that if someone rejected my Jesus while I was witnessing to him, I would get in their face and try to debate with him why they needed to do this now. And I would try and debate with those around me that had a difference of opinion. But as I've grown over the last 33 years of knowing Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I respond to them in love. And I realize now that it's my responsibility to share with them the Word of God. It's my responsibility to share Jesus with them. But I can't save them. It's the Holy Spirit who is going to convict and convert them. So all I have to do is worry about my part, my effort, my responsibility. And it takes the conflict out of it. And I'm able to respond with love. First, we see the people behind the mission. Second, we see the process, which is that of the being built up. Thirdly, we see the product. And finally, we see the power. Now, the power, you should know. We've always known it. We've known it since you were little in in VBS. The answer is... Jesus. It's always been Jesus. He's the reason 
for all of it. We, it's not the man in the pulpit. It's not the programs. It's not the websites. It's Jesus. I want you to see that God designed a perfect world. And man messed it up. We broke it. So what did we need? We needed Jesus. Because we could not do it. And the sooner we realized that education wasn't going to get you there, money wasn't going to get you there, power wasn't going to get you there, trying to be a good person wasn't going to get you there. None of those things was going to restore the brokenness of the relationship that we were intended to have with God. The only thing that could do it to restore that relationship is Jesus on the cross. He went to the cross bearing our sins, my sins, your sins, and he died a horrific death. He paid a penalty that he didn't owe that we couldn't pay. He shed his blood. His body was broken for us. He was put in a tomb, and three days later, he rose from the dead. And all of us who believe in him and repent of our sins, which is simply saying, I want to turn from my ways, and I want to live my life according to God's ways. It's a 180 degree turn. If we'll do that, we'll have salvation. It's by believing in the life, death, and resurrection. How do we fulfill this mission of God? It's really simple. We need to get full of God. We need to equip the saints for the work. That's everyone in here. We equip them for the work so that, that you guys, so that we can do the ministry, so that we can be built up. Not so that I can be built up, not so that you can be built up, but so that the church, the body, can be built up. In a moment, we're going to have three invitations. The first one is, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's real simple. You need to believe in the life, death, and resurrection. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says that if you will confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The first invitation is for you. Would you believe? Would you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Would you repent of your sins and turn to him? The second invitation is, if you are already a believer, we have the Lord's Supper up here. We don't go row by row. Just whenever you're ready, in a moment, I'm just going to say I want you to remember when we do this, when we take the Lord's Supper, we do this in remembrance of what Jesus has done for you and for me. How he shed his blood and his body was broken. How he died on the cross. That horrific death. We do it in remembrance. Remember that when you take the Lord's Supper. And the third thing, that invitation that we're going to have is that, the, that we remember what Jesus has done and that we come here on Sundays to worship Him, to thank Him, to sing joy to Him. So I'm going to ask that when you sing that you open up 
and that you sing a joyful noise coming from you. That every person in here would sing and sing loud. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for all that you do, for your word that you've given us that is a love letter to us, Lord, that you would love us so much, Lord, that you would send your son for us, for me individually, for each and every person in here individually. You sent your son. For those out there in the world that don't know him yet, Lord, you sent your son into this world that if we would only believe, we could have an eternal relationship with you. Thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in this church body. And I ask, Lord, that we would remember the freedom that we have And that you would help us, Lord, to sing loudly as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.